Welcome to tonight's Corona Conversations event. Before I introduce our panel, I just wanted to say a couple of things to you. Um, the chat function is very much there for you to use. Please do post links to relevant uh, websites and information. Please do comment, uh, but also ask questions and we'll do our best to put those questions to the panel as we go through this evening. We will moderate the channel, the, the chat function. So if we have anyone abusing that chat function, any uh, inappropriate behavior or abuse uh, in that chat function, we will kick you out, I'm afraid. So zero tolerance of that. And we have had that happen once before and we were very quick and hot on it. Please don't do that. Let's make sure we have a good conversation and we use the chat function well. Uh, the approach to dealing with coronavirus has very much been at the national level and we felt it was really long overdue that we took a regional lens to this issue because it seems pretty obvious to me and I'm sure to many of you that we can't beat this virus and we can't recover economically until and unless we really think about how we bring the different regions and local authorities with us to ensure that women wherever they are all over the country are um, both better protected and also able to participate in that economic recovery. And I just want to share a couple of data, um, a couple of statistics with you, which actually are from our previous devolution work, just to give you a bit of context for where we start this conversation. So pre-COVID, pre-coronavirus. Um, so for example, in Greater Manchester, we know there are 73,000 missing women from the Greater Manchester labour market, or at least there were a couple of years ago when we did that research. And with a pay gap of about £9,400, uh, so earning £9,400 a year less on average than men. Um, ethnic minority women, the employment rate was 47%, whereas for white women it was 73%. So a huge difference in participation of Black, Asian and minority ethnic women. In the West Midlands, the employment gap actually was even greater, it was 108,000. And actually was, that employment gap grew over a period of time. So it gone from 10% to 12%. And in terms of social care, we looked at what difference would it make if we invested in social care, obviously a huge issue right now, if we actually got decent paying conditions for our social care sector. Um, and there it was worth 4.4 billion pounds to the West Midlands economies. It would have actually help to grow the economy in the West Midlands if we invested in social care. 83% of that social care workforce are women and 23% are on zero hours contracts. That's in the West Midlands region. So that's all pre-COVID. That's before we got to this crisis. Now, obviously, we've seen what's happened in Leicester, the local lockdown, and we know that that's probably the first of a number of those local lockdowns. So what happens in the regions is going to be more important as we go forward. And we know that it's been a controversial relationship, shall we say, between central government and local government and regional governments in terms of both data sharing, consultation and general kind of partnership working. So that's one of the issues we definitely want to explore this evening. But more importantly, how, how we build back better and whether we can really fundamentally depends on how well we work with our regions. So we're really pleased to be having this conversation this evening. So I just want to move to introduce our panel now. Um, I'll say a few words about each of them and uh, we'll try and keep it quite chatty and quite lively and give you a chance to contribute as we go through the event. So first person I'm going to introduce is Asma Day, who's a journalist with the Huffington Post, uh, an award-winning journalist, I should say, uh, who's based in Preston, Lancashire, and uh, her work brings a perspective and views from outside the London bubble. Um, and Asma specialises in investigations, original stories with a human interest focus, and wants to ensure people from all diversities of life have the chance to make their voices heard and to highlight inequalities and injustices they may be facing. So welcome, Asma. Hi everyone. Deborah Cabman. Deborah Cabman OBE, who's Chief Executive of the West Midlands Combined Authority. And Deborah's been really supportive and, and involved in Fawcett's work over the last few years. She became uh, Chief Executive of the Combined Authority in September 2017, following over 30 years in public service. Previous senior roles include Head of Policy at Redcar and Cleveland Borough Council, and Local Government Advisor to the Ministerial Team at the Department of Environment, Transport and the Regions. So welcome, Deborah. Thank you very much. Now I'll introduce Pam, who is Pam Smith, Chief Executive of Stockport Council. She's also Greater Manchester's lead Chief Executive for Age Friendly Greater Manchester and is a key driver of the Greater Manchester Women and Girls Equality Panel, which is a new initiative that I'm sure she'll tell us a bit more about. And that Fawcett is really delighted to see um, Greater Manchester uh, launching in, on because we've been calling for it. Um, the panel's aim is to accelerate gender equality across Greater Manchester's 10 boroughs to enable women and girls 
to live their best lives through equal opportunities to start well, live well and age well. So great to have you with us, Pam. Thank you. I'll introduce Chris, who's our token man for this evening. Sorry, Chris. Um, who's the Associate Director of Savannah Comrades and he's done some very important work because he's the man with the numbers and we're going to hear a bit more about him, uh, those uh, new data in a moment. He works closely with media, think tanks, trade unions, campaign organisations and political parties on a wide range of communication and policy focused research topics, often conducting research amongst hard to reach and vulnerable groups. So good to have you with us, Chris. Thank you, Son. And next, but last but not least, is Namaiwa, who's a singer, songwriter and composer. Um, she comes from Birmingham. She's an international recording artist, a performer and songwriter speaking truth to power with a fearless lyrical approach to subjects that mean a lot to her. Deeply passionate about raising the profile of black, Asian and minority ethnic women and girls across the West Midlands, and she hopes to build a change movement through Namaiwa Change Formation, her music and story, to be a part of systemic change for all people in a meaningful way. So Namaiwa, really delighted to have you with us as well this evening. So I'm going to go straight into questions, questions from me first of all, but then I will look to the chat function and make sure we bring you in. Um, first, I want, to, I want to come to you, Deborah, first, actually, um, to just think about decision making and you know, what your take is on decision making in this lockdown period and the involvement or lack of involvement in the regions. How, how has it been for you in the West Midlands? I think I think the overriding uh, emotion I think for for a while was frustration and um, uh, and that was primarily because of the lack of um, subsidiarity around decision making. So um, you know at the beginning of the crisis, everything was centralised in central government. Uh, so if you recall the shielding arrangements that were put in place, it was all managed by. Uh, from the centre and central government, so so they um, they lost uh, the opportunity to do it right first time, um, and then we had to retrofit a, a process that just wasn't appropriate. So, you know, how would they know that you know there were people that they were delivering food to who couldn't eat the food because they were vegetarian or because of cult cultural um, requirements? Um, you know, women weren't engaged fully, I don't think, who were shielding about the, the particular um, support they needed. We all saw the rise in domestic violence, yet if it had been placed and rooted in at a local level, not necessarily in local government, but with local community groups and in, in communities themselves, I think we, we would have we would have been able to have responded much quicker and much more appropriately. Um, so, so it was a bit, a bit of frustration, really, um, initially. And then in terms of broader decision making, um, I have to say local government rose to the challenge and were absolutely magnificent and just demonstrated that, you know, when the chips are down, local government is where it needs to be, which is working very closely with its communities and delivering the services and providing the support it needs to, uh, needs to provide. So, so mixed emotions, really. But... Um, but we've been quite feisty as a region with central government around decision making and where where we found blocks we just said you know what we're just going to do it ourselves because we're going to do the right thing in the right way and that's really positive to hear and i think um we've heard that coming through from other local authorities as well in terms of you know, the fact that they've seized the initiative and, and taken really sort of risen to the challenge themselves yeah. but it's frustrating as you say when you're not getting that kind of engagement from from national government yeah. Pam, can i bring in on this from a sort of greater manchester perspective and for you to tell us how your experience has, has been through it through this crisis in terms of your engagement with central government and also maybe anything you've been able to do working across the regions or working with others yeah, I think we've um, definitely, as a city region, come together on things like PPE um, because there was clearly um, a shortage and problems with the distribution of PPE. So we've worked collectively on that. We had a lead in Greater Manchester um, for that to support, particularly our care home sector. Um, we um, uh, in Greater Manchester, some of us continued with the testing uh, when it was stepped down so we took a local decision around that um, and we've stepped in as Deborah said we've had to be there as um, you know um, unfortunately the backup team sometimes um, we didn't want to be the backup 
backup team we have it um, delivering but we we've had to um, or um, some of the things that haven't worked as well as they could have done we acknowledge that you know the government's never been in this position before none of us have ever been in this position before um, and it was going to be messy um, but I think it would have um, been more helpful if things could have been devolved quicker and sooner to local government which has got those community connections and we could have made more of them um, and I think the challenge for us now is to galvanize that community spirit which has been built upon um, across the regions and across different communities um, so that we can continue su supporting people because this is an ongoing situation it's it's not something that um, you know it's not dealing with your normal um, emergency you know I, I, I dealt with the um, Todd Brook water incident. We knew there was water in the reservoir. We knew it was going to come or not. Um, this, is, this is not like that. This is an ongoing situation. So I think in Greater Manchester, we've acknowledged that and we're trying to now put in place um, the, the continuing humanitarian support um, and the decision-making processes in place so that we can learn from what's happened and make sure our communities continue to be resilient. And that's really important, isn't it, in terms of how we go forward? Because as you say, we're, we're not at the end of this by any stretch as yet. Um, can I just ask you to say a little bit more about the panel and the, 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 that we're setting up in, in Greater Manchester? That feels like a really positive development. And what's the time frame for that? And do you think it will have any kind of bearing on how you respond to COVID? Yeah, the time frame for that is we're out to advert at the moment for panellists. We want to make sure that there is a rich diversity of panellists. That's really, really important. Um, you know, the survey that's been undertaken is um, from different socioeconomic backgrounds, different ethnic backgrounds, different community backgrounds. It's really important that we get that women's voice in there in the next couple of months and that we really listen um, to women and what their issues are. And we integrate it into the decision making structures. And I think that's really important. We've got 10 districts in Greater Manchester and it's important that we have representation not only from the different sections but the different geographies um, because they play out quite differently across Greater Manchester and it's really important to us that that voice um, is rooted in the decision making processes and that it informs policy and that we make sure that women feel they have a voice and it's easy because women have busy lives and we we make sure that it's we use the technology the digital technology um, to make it easier to interact um, so so for me it's about making sure that that voice is integrated into policy it's uh, as i've said uh, we're out to advert it'll happen in the next few months um, the mayor will be uh, really keen to hear the voice of women i know he's really keen as are the other leaders and I think it's incredibly important that we, um, to use um, a phrase, we crack on with it. Um, and we are really specific about the actions and the targets that we're going to put in place so that we're not just listening to women, we're actually taking actions on the things that matter. And then when we look back in 12 months time, we have a measure of what, we, what, we've, what we've done. Um, and how we've managed to integrate that voice into those decision-making processes. Yeah, that's really important. And Deborah, you've you've run a citizens panel in the West Midlands. So tell us a bit more about that and how how has that worked and that involved women. You're on mute. Thank you. <laughs> uh, right. Am I am I muted? No, you're All not right. Now. Great. Okay. I'm unmuted by the host. Um, and and I'm I'm really pleased to see uh, we've got Claire Spencer on um, as as part of the audience here. So Claire, I don't know whether you can speak, but you might want to contribute. So um, we we decided that um, in order to uh, have appropriate recovery or plans for recovery, we needed to ask the community two things. One, how have they experienced COVID? What's been their experience? And secondly. What do we need to do as a, a, a public sector and a private sector actually um, to ensure that there is resilient recovery that meets the needs of a whole range of communities across across the region and, it, and it's been absolutely phenomenal um, it's been a really really good thing for us to do we are now in the process of pulling together 
the priorities for recovery um, and work through how we can ensure that the citizen's voice um, continues to inform and, and help us along this journey, which as, um, as Pam said, isn't, isn't going to be a quick journey, it's going to be a marathon. Uh, I suspect we'll see outbreaks, more outbreaks uh, in the future. So we need to be, you know, really thoughtful and, and resilient about the way in which we respond to those. At the same time, also addressing some of the disadvantages that some of our residents are experiencing. So the under 25s, women, uh, those representing BAME communities. So um, we've been really targeted and thoughtful about that. But it's been it's been absolutely the right thing to do and it's been brilliant really really good and and i'm really happy to share the outcome of that um with with the group so we can put it on um you know we can we can allow it to be accessed by people if they're particularly interested in it that's brilliant we'd love to link to that actually and promote yeah, that absolutely well. right and women's voice really was, cool. was very loud on that panel as well and quite rightly excellent so. what we want to hear um Asma and Namaiwa, can I come to you both now? Asma, firstly, just tell us a bit more about what you're picking up through your work in terms of women's experiences in, well, perhaps in your region and the region you live, but also the regions you report on. Um, I think the important thing that uh, the coronavirus crisis has really brought to the fore is that women are disproportionately affected in so many ways all the time. And I think the pandemic's really just sort of shone a light on some of the some of the issues that people are grappling with all the time anyway. Um, but I think it's really given an opportunity to ask questions, um, look for solutions, um, highlight you know inequalities and injustices, and uh, and the way we at HuffPost want like to do things is we want to give people a voice so they can tell their stories in their own words. Um, um, so there's no need to sensationalise; it's just people's real stories. Um, and that's what we've been, we really felt it's important to give people, uh, everyone from, you know, single mums, um, those um, trapped in domestic abuse situations, um, those battling poverty, people worrying about how they're going to feed their children, people from uh, black, Asian and ethnic minority backgrounds and how they've been impacted disproportionately by the virus in so many ways. You know, there's been larger number of deaths, but also the fact that they um, and maybe put, put in situations through the work and the jobs they do. So that's really something that women in particular may, may find that, you know, they're in forward facing roles on the front line. Um, so I think, I think um, the important thing is um, to realize that it has actually, um, it is important to highlight that the, the, um, these, this is the way women and people from different minorities have been impacted by the virus, but also the fact that some of the situations they face aren't just during the pandemic, but they're all the time. So there they needs to be more long term solution, which isn't just a short term fix um, du during uh, this crisis. Yeah, that's a really important point as well, because we're really showing a, shining a light on you know, systemic inequality that was there already through this crisis. And that's that's what's been very transparent from the beginning. Now, Myra, can I come to you just in terms of your experience in both personal and uh, you know this sort of campaigning work that you're doing using your profile and your role what what are you finding in your region yeah i mean similarly to what asma just said about the fact that we're highlighting issues that have already been there before i found that i'm coming from an arts background so music and theater background in terms of my practice um and found that even before the pandemic had hit there was a lack of resources funding um, a lack of systemic support like regionally with arts organizations that are actually able to support women in an intersectional way so it's not just in either giving them funding it's about giving them funding and then giving them the business development to actually make something happen and progress with that so I think the pandemic's highlighted for me that the people who wasn't already getting support have been double affected or triple affected by the lack of support and systems that were there in the first place um, I think just as, as a response to that from funders um, that have stepped up to support musicians in vulnerable positions, I think it's been quite impressive and I've been quite like, you know, happy with how funders and PRS and Help for Music, Music Managers Forum, how institutions that musicians have to use daily have stepped up to support. So I'm seeing, yeah, I'm seeing 
response to it in a way that actually helps us and goes direct and it's not actually that hard or that difficult to access. Um, so yeah, hopefully that continues as we move forward and build back. And have you seen any sign of this arts funding in your region? Have you had any news on how that's going to feed through? You were, the government's arts funding in particular, I'm talking about their 1.5 billion they announced. No, I'm quite interested to see how it's going to be disseminated. Um, I have, I had reservations about it at first because I felt like it would be problematic to give that amount of money, whether it's spread across main organisations or leading organisations in the arts, if they already are not able to support women based on the representation in their team or their outreach teams or learning participation departments are not already engaging with those women or with people from ethnic minority backgrounds giving them the money doesn't seem to help i think after reading the research as well it kind of backs up my initial thoughts of thinking that it's about co-creating spaces in the community with people and actually in the process of building up uh, mental health centers or pop-up centers it's about women in those community actually receiving the business development to keep that going and keep momentum going in the communities should this ever happen again or we have second waves we're able to then you know respond to it very well yeah yeah one of the things we've been calling for amongst other things is, is a proper equality impact assessment of how that money is going to be spent for example because our concern is it won't find its way to the right people and again it will just kind of get uh, fed into those who have already you know got more resource and, and advantage in the systems that, that's uh, something that you know an equality impact assessment could prevent um chris i'm going to come to you now to share the research slides with us so we can see a little bit more about the data before we um carry on with the conversation and also bring in the audience a bit more um i think chris is going to share his screen with us now so let's hear this technology works here we are there's a few slides so i'm going to hand over to you chris yeah thanks sam um, so yeah, uh, I'll run through the data sort of very quickly, but I think one thing that, that was quite striking to, to us as researchers was that um, the, the data seemed to be fairly similar across both regions, which I think was interesting. That doesn't necessarily mean that there's going to be a one size fits all approach in the response. And I think what was striking within the data as well is that although um, the responses of all women were very similar across both regions. There were some really key and striking sort of demographic differences. But you can see just on this slide, which is the West Midlands, and things don't change very much when we move to Greater Manchester, especially when we're talking about health. Um, so I'll just run through a few, a few sort of key takeaways, particularly regarding health, because this was something that stood out quite a lot. Um, so the message really from, from women in both regions was pretty clear. Um, they see the provision of health services at a local level is really important and many would use them if they were available. We found three quarters of women, in, at least in both regions, I think it hit four and five in, in Greater Manchester, say that it's important for local or combined authorities to provide mental health services um, and other health related services such as physical health assessments and provision of green spaces were also placed on a bit of a pedestal above some other sort of traditional council services that, that, that might be available. Um, exercise and advice and support weren't quite as important um, compared to sort of mental health provision and physical health assessments, but that might just be down to the mass availability of those, uh, of those services. And contrary to what I've already said, it, what was really interesting about this was that there were hardly any demographic differences, women whether you know, of different ethnicities, of different ages, different employment statuses and home situations and, and, and financial backgrounds as well, um, all viewed mental health and physical health um, more importantly than they would sort of employment and things like that. Um, there also seemed to be a bit of an implication that uh, if these services were made available as a sort of local pop-up uh, in a hub, um, they would be used. So I think half of women in both regions said that they would use physical health um, assessment centres if, if they were locally available. Similarly, similar numbers with, with, with mental health. Um, so, you know, although half of women are saying that they perhaps would not, um, half were, and those that were most likely to use them did tend to be um, younger women, um, women from, um, from from BAME communities, and also parents, but also potentially sort of those from higher household incomes and, and the higher socioeconomic groups. I think what we found generally throughout this this research is that it was actually women from higher higher household incomes and higher socioeconomic groups that did tend to say that they had 
um, that, that COVID has impacted them slightly more, but they might have been from a considerably more elevated position and therefore had to slightly further to fall perhaps than, um, than, than those are, are from a lower socioeconomic group. And we also seem to think that desire for these services may stem from the way that sort of COVID pandemic has, has affected day, uh, everyday life. So more than a third of women in the West Midlands um, and a few more, I think, in Greater Manchester said that their diet and their mental health have considerably worsened during the lockdown. And equally, women were at sort of one and a half times more likely to say that their physical health had got worse rather than better. And um, the difference was particularly stark among women, uh, again, from, from a lower household income. Um, there were also some striking findings in the sense that um, women were almost twice as likely to say that their self-confidence had gotten worse rather than better. And we think that this really pointed to quite a de deterioration of not only mental health, but just general well-being during the last sort of four months. Um, despite this, uh, women have been walking more during lockdown, but I think that that's probably not surprising considering uh, the government's um, rules regarding transport and, and things like that. Um, and although the women did tend to tell us that they had more time to do various things, including exercise during lockdown, I think, as Pam already said, you know, women, women are busy and I think it's just going down to um, the general rules that were put in and, and, and women may have had more time to do things. But again, um, those that were more likely to say that they had more time did, had tended to have been furloughed or maybe made redundant um, or maybe working reduced hours. So I think that, that it kind of makes sense in terms of what, what they were saying. Um, I've touched on that briefly already, but we'll hit, hit on employment. Um, again, there wasn't huge sort of regional differences between, between the two regions, but um, in terms of the importance of employment services and what local authorities should, should provide, they were kind of in a second tier, just below um, general health provision. Um, so it was clear that, 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 that women did want um, did, or do think it's important for local and regional authorities to, to provide some employment help. Um, I think the most striking findings within employment were really how jobs have changed for women in the last sort of four months during the pandemic. So we can see here, again, this is uh, just in the West Midlands, but it was very similar to Manchester, that um, a fair few have seen hours change, have seen location change, or have been furloughed. I think about one in five had been furloughed. Uh, I think across both um, regional authorities as well, out of those four particular changes, we, we've seen um, one in 10 have sort of more than one thing affect them. So whether that was changing location or changing hours or um, changing pay as well, uh, sort of taking a, taking a pay cut during this pandemic. Um, you know, some, one, about one in 10 women have had two of those things happen and that can be quite, quite stressful for, for, for anyone, particularly you know, for even worse you know, during a pandemic when, when there's so much uncertainty. And we did also just find that just only one in five had experienced absolutely no change in their role. Um, you know, those that had been furloughed disproportionately um, were categorised in the lower social grades. So a third of DEs had been furloughed compared to one in seven ABs. And I think that really does hit, hit, hit that kind of socioeconomic divide that furlough may have caused. Um, again, specifically looking at hours, two thirds of those working women whose hours had changed are now working reduced hours. And that equates to about one in six working women overall across both regions. Um, we also found sort of economically that changes in job security had quite a knock-on effect on the, the, the ability to cover living expenses. Roughly sort of two in five women said that they were comfortably covering, covering their living expenses before the pandemic hit, but that dropped um, by a fifth when we're asking if they can cover their living expenses at the moment. Um, more than a quarter are now saying that they're struggling compared to one in six pre-lockdown. And, you know, we found that that, 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 that was, that there didn't seem to be um, much optimism going forward. I think, you know, when we had, in the way that we asked the question, um, although fewer women said that they might be struggling in one, three or six months time, that tended to be women converting to not knowing where they'll be in one to six months time, rather than saying that they'll actually be more comfortable um, in, in that period. Um, having said all this, I think what we found striking again, when asking some employment questions, was that there was quite a desire to retrain and reskill, and that comes back to some things that have already been said. Um, you know, if, if these, some of these services can be provided, particularly maybe as a, as a local pop up, um, women will, you know, are keen to, 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 to go to these and, and to take, take advantage of them. Um, again, they did tend to be um, BAME women, parents and, and younger women. 
Um, but I think uh, you know there, there was also so it seemed to be a bit of a desire for for some skills retraining, and we also looked at um, we looked at which sectors women might want to upskill retraining. And while health and social care was was at the top, you know that might just be down to the um, the, 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 the gravitas that we that we're holding our health and social care workers we're in at the moment but overall you know at least a third of women said that they were that they had thought about doing some kind of retraining um during during this period so i think that that was quite telling that you know if if, if women may have more time to do various things now but they've given a thought about their career um about upskilling about retraining and about, and about progressing particularly in the workplace and then one final one that i'll just touch on um because we didn't ask too many questions about digital skills. Um, but one thing that we did find really telling um, was that um, women did seem to, that there seemed to be a bit of a, um, a bit of a discrepancy in their perception of, 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 of their sort of physical, or sorry, digital capability. So we found that generally four and five women said that they had satisfactory internet to browse the internet. Uh, three quarters roughly said that they had satisfactory uh, internet at home to to stream films and television, but only half said that they had a satisfactory internet to work from home. And as we've seen or in some previous questions, way more women are now working from home. Um, and that may be something that, 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 that continues a pace in the near future, uh, particularly as we uh, enter, I guess, the, the, the least uh, enjoyed phrase at the moment, the new normal. Um, so if there is this perceptions gap, then perhaps women will be less likely to take jobs that requires home working, even though it could, you know, obviously um, really increase sort of flexibility and potentially a work-life balance. Um, so, you know, while we think that there you know, could be some in infrastructure issues, I think that that discrepancy was quite telling. And like I say, while around a quarter of working women are now working from home as a result of the pandemic, it may be something that sooner than necessity um, rather than a luxury that, 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 that home working and upskilling digitally is, is really important in these local economies um, to facilitate an easier home working uh, setup and, and lifestyle. Thanks very much, Chris. Um, it's really interesting data there. Um, and I think we'll be making this data available after the event as well for those who want to see the data set. Um, uh, there's one question actually just come in the chat function about sample size. Now, I think it was a thousand women in each region, a representative sample. Is that right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Lovely. Um, so there's there's loads of questions coming in now. So I, I'm going to come back to the panel just to reflect on that data and just ask one. The first question that's come in, which, you know, how how are we going to make sure we're using this data to inform policy um, and how we spend money and you know going forward? So is is this data useful and can we use it in a way at combined authority level, which is actually going to inform what we do going forward? That's from Jane Kemp actually at Best Middle's Women's Voice. So Deborah, perhaps I'll put that one to you first just is there anything that sort of leaps out at you when you sort of listen to some of those numbers uh yeah um all of it um is important and um what i want to assure the audience that this will inform our recovery plans so um it's quite fortuitous that i'm chair of the regional recovery uh coordination group so um so uh uh, we, we have the opportunity to dictate not just what we do in terms of recovery, but how we do it as well. So, so using data, using the systems panel, engaging with our young combined authority, supporting and engaging with West Women's Voice, West Midlands Women's Voice to do events like this uh, and to commission them to do additional engagement and research is really, really important. So, so I, I, want, I want to reassure people that this is something that we'll, we, we will use as a basis to inform our work going forward, certainly our recovery plans. At a specific level, the statistic that makes my heart bleed is that statistic that says that women's confidence has, has been reduced through COVID. And it's just, it's, that, that's, that's the most serious issue for me, in addition to all that, you know, uh, you know income levels and etc cetera, etc cetera. but the fact that women feel less than they are because of their experience of covid is something that we have to be really thoughtful about and and i think is really particularly troubling um we are being quite specific about retraining and, and reskilling uh we're targeting women in particular um, but we're also doing um lots of work around providing apprenticeships and employment support uh, for young women coming out. And we've got some really good statistics about 
um, what we've done and what we're intending to do going forward specifically for those women that may well find themselves uh, unemployed post-COVID. And we know that when furlough lifts, we can expect to see the numbers of unemployed increase uh, significantly. Um, and I know, Sam, you were going to ask me a question about the impact of so many of our retail organisations um, shutting up shop and, and what's the impact of that on the regional economy and, and, it, and it will be significant, it will be significant about the vitality and vibrancy of our town centres and our high streets in particular but you know that the, the majority of, of uh, those that work in retail are often women and young women at that so, so we've been really thoughtful about the impact of the reduction in retail jobs and what that means and how we can compensate that through retraining in other growth sectors that we're seeing from the region. Yeah, and I think that's, again, really, really important, isn't it, to understand the sort of gendered impact of that because so many of those employees, as you say, will be women, they'll be young women, they'll be low paid women, and they're the first to go. And that's in that through the, the data as well that Chris has shown as well. There's lots of questions coming in now, so I'm just going to put another question to you, Pam. So thinking about um, services in the region, and there's a question here about domestic abuse services in particular, is there anything that you're doing in Greater Manchester to support domestic abuse services? Are you seeing an increase, I suspect you probably are, significant increase in demand for those services, calls to the police and so on. What, how are you responding to that? Yeah, we, we have seen an increase in, uh, as, as everybody across country has, an uh, increase in domestic abuse cases. And what we've done is we've tried to um, use uh, what we've already got. So, for example, um, some of our housing providers have um, kept vacancies so that um, women have got somewhere to go very, very quickly. Um, we wouldn't have normally have done that. Uh, but so that's an example of, of, of some of the things that we're doing. Uh, also looking to what are the different models providing domestic abuse. I don't know if anybody's heard of Auntie's House, um, where this is about women offering other women rooms in their home temporarily. temporarily uh, but but we, we're looking at all those things. But that's what we've done. We've tried to uh, work with our housing providers to make sure that women have got um, a place to go, but also um, having programmes for perpetrators as well, um, because this is uh, as much an issue to stop the domestic violence as it is to give safety and a safe haven uh, for when women really need it. Um, so we, we, we're trying to tackle the um, issue from, from both sides, and I think it's important to do the preventative stuff as well as provide those safe, ha safe havens. Um, but the fact that we um, have seen domestic abuse go up at such a level, um, and I think that, and that coupled with women's confidence levels dropping, as, as Deborah said, I think is a, a, a real concern because we want to build back better and set women up for success. Um, and that means that we are going to have to have more targeted and, and tailored programs. As Chris said, this isn't one size fits all. And I think that's going to be a challenge for us, um, given the financial challenges that we face, to make sure that we have enough programs at scale, but that we also tailor programs to meet women's specific needs. Yeah, again, that's that's really important, isn't it? So responding to specific groups of women in through all of this. Um, a few questions on the chat function are, are being points to being raised about self-employed women um you know so basically being a forgotten group you know and they as, as businesses and as as workers they're very much kind of not being catered for through the government response and i wondered Namira, from your point of view in the arts sector for example where many many employees the vast majority of the thought are probably self-employed on this sort of very very loose contracts at least what what have you seen in your sector Um, yeah, I mean, just can you hear me now? Yeah, I think the initial like cancellation, there was two weeks where everything just went from booked to cancelled. And that probably echoes the confidence thing because it's about momentum, especially in a freelance capacity. You know, you're working on projects or you're, you're working to build a brand or a profile. So that kind of slowing down would give um, any person who's been working hard on their ambitions a bit of a confidence knock. Um, I think 
it, in the same way that things kind of fell, I think the music industry responded quickly and we had um, Blackout Tuesday quite soon after it. So, and obviously that was related to um, the Black Lives Matter movement and supporting that conversation. Um, so I think because of that, there was, come up, I'm going to say the word wrong, camaraderie, camaraderie, um, togetherness. There was a sense of like community globally for the music industry. So I think for me, I felt that the response was quick in terms of people being on it and people being responsive. And that kind of replaced some of the lack of confidence or feeling isolated or alone for me personally. Um, yeah, and again, just on that, the, the thread of organisations or institutions that I lean on to support. There's more local organisations as well, um, not just uh, big institutions like PRS, like Punch Records is a great platform at the moment for me. They're supporting me with my uh, business ventures, um, giving me actual direct support. So I know that there are people and tastemakers and organisations that are, are, are key in doing that. I think it's about closing the gaps down to make it easier for women who perhaps weren't already in that before to get that and, and reintroducing them themselves to the community and having a wider reach. Um, yeah. Thanks very much. And, and Asma, I just want to ask you about a point that Min Zazal has made on here, where she says, what about racism, sexism, discrimination and harassment? And I just wondered whether you, in your coverage of this issue, picked up any stories that particularly highlighted that. We certainly see it nationally, for example, with increases in pregnancy discrimination and women feeling they can't challenge being discriminated against because they're scared of losing their jobs. So, you know, equal pay cases, for example, have fallen through the floor because they can't challenge pay discrimination. So have you, have you picked anything up like that? Um, yeah, definitely. I think, um, I think it has brought the whole issue of discrimination and racism to the fore. Um, I mean, from, from things like um, the, the high numbers of people from black, Asian, ethnic minority backgrounds who've um, lost their lives to COVID. Um, you know, there's been things like, you know, people working in the NHS saying that they're too afraid to speak out because um, of the way the institutions and organisations are, that they're too worried to raise their fears. So if they feel they don't want to be in a front line like, low, a role, they, they, they're too scared to sort of voice, uh, can I move somewhere else because they think it might impact their jobs. Uh, there's also um, the fact that there hasn't really been um, too many answers from um, government on why um, um, there have been, you know, these, this section of community has been affected. Um, and I think there's been a real call for transparency, really. I think that that's uh, something that's come to, uh, come to the fore. Um, I, it, with the Leicester um, lockdown, um, I did a piece where I spoke to lots of um, people in the community, including women, who talked about how um, the fact that there has been uh, an extra lockdown in Leicester, they, they typically found themselves becoming the target of racists. So uh, there being, there's, a, there's a real culture of blame when, when you actually dig down and look into some of the reasons why, again, it, the explanations didn't come out um, as fully as they should have done. You know, uh, I think locally the authority said that they felt that they should have been warned in advance that, you know, the, 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 the rate was going higher. But it's brought a lot of issues such as poverty, such as slave labour, you know, all sorts of issues, um, uh, inequality to, to, to the fore, when actually it's so much easier for people to just um, blame certain communities and, uh, uh, you know, finger point and uh, bring out sort of racist, um, uh, racist connotations. So I think that there are, there are lots of things that um, this crisis have highlighted which need to be tackled and answers that need to be given and inquiries that need to be held. Um, and I think there are lots of people and uh, including women who have been disproportionately impacted. And I think until we get th thorough answers, um, we're not gonna be able to make sure uh, these people don't carry on suffering and that they, it doesn't happen again in the future. Yeah, absolutely. Amen to that. We've absolutely got to get some answers to, to all of this when we do have that inquiry. Chris, we're getting quite a few questions about the data, so I just wanted to come to you just to give us a bit more information. So some people are saying, did you get comparative data for men? Um, one question I wanted to ask you was, but you, you found that women said they had a bit more time in their hands. Was that also true of mothers and those caring, for example, which I suspect may not have been the case, but just is, have you got anything more you can tell us about the data? 
Yeah, so there is no comparison to men, unfortunately. Um, I think it would be useful to do it as a control, um, but it wasn't something that we were commissioned to do, so, so we didn't do it. Um, I think there was one question generally about, about confidence and if there was a comparator to, to, to men on that. I think you know, there's been lots and lots of research over the years um, about the differences between men and women's confidence. So my, my, my strong hunch would be if we asked the same question to men, they would not say that their self-confidence has deteriorated during the pandemic in the same way that women have. Um, we don't have that data to back that up, but I'm going to put myself out on a little bit of a limb there. Um, I think in terms of um, the time question, I, I'm not sure, to be honest. I think, you know, we, obviously we did ask it to parents. We didn't necessarily ask anyone if anyone had any caring responsibilities. Um, but I, I, my guess would be that I think women would have tended to have said that they did have more time net to do some of the activities that we listed. Um, but I think that may well just be down to the, the overall impression that I think the government wants to drive forward during the pandemic that, you know, if we're not working, um, if we are not going out, if we're not socialising, then yes, we've got more time to do various things just, just, just naturally. I don't think that that, that, that that question necessarily captures the home pressures that, that people will be under. But in terms of net hours in the day, then yes, possibly. You may, you know, I think women did tend overall to say that, that they did have more time to do various things. Okay, thanks very much, Phil. I mean, another interesting question, which I'm going to raise because it's been an issue we've been banging on about recently, which is childcare. So um, Lisa says, any thoughts on childcare services? Lack of that provision is what seems like a demise in providers. And I know that there's, there was, again, pre-COVID, there was an issue about sufficient childcare places in both Greater Manchester and, and the West Midlands. So Deborah, I just wonder from your perspective, what you're seeing in terms of childcare provision at all in the region, or is that something that's a concern to you? Um, going forward because it's one of those enabling sectors we want to get the economy going again and actually getting childcare going again and protecting what little bit of childcare sector we've got seems quite important. Okay. I'm muted. Yeah. You're all right. Am I back? No. Um, yeah. it, it is a real concern for us and you're absolutely right Sam it is one of those enabling sectors that we um, we need to be up and running to allow women to, to return to work but but it's not just um, it's not just childcare, it's education as well. So a lot of women who are working from home are also self-schooling their kids, etc. And, and a lot of women are making a judgment call about not, not returning to work actually because it's too difficult because they don't have the right provision. So part of our, our skills work that we're looking at is um, skilling up more women to do um, childcare and but also to support those SMEs, those small businesses. Um, to ensure that they stay in business. Uh, a lot of um, our childcare providers have furloughed their staff, some of their staff are deciding not to come back. Um, and we're also ensuring that they're getting the support they need because, you know, to, to comply with the, the health and safety guidelines, uh, et cetera, et cetera, is just too onerous for some of our smaller providers. So we're working through our business hubs, uh, through our um, uh, chambers of commerce, to ensure that we can provide support and guidance to those small businesses to keep them to keep them running. But but it is a, a real concern, and I don't think it's just a concern for the West Midlands. I think it's a, a national concern as well. And and you've heard me talk about the importance of early years and and appropriate childcare. You know, it is shocking that so many of our uh, you know, uh, children in this region are not school ready. There's a third of our children that are not school ready by the age of four. And that means, you know, they can't, they can't speak properly. They're still being presented in nappies, et cetera, et cetera. And that disadvantage stays with them throughout all of their education career. So when we pick them up at 17 and 18, you know, we've got a double, you know, it's doubly difficult to ensure that they, they have the right opportunities and they have access to work, et cetera, et cetera. So, so we're, really, um, we're really concerned about the, the provision of childcare because it, it, it kind of feeds, you know, lots more uh, disadvantage and exclusion than, uh, than we need to see across this region. But we are, we are absolutely focused on trying to remediate that. And we've been lobbying the Chancellor to spend some of his billions on uh, the childcare sector and has yet not been successful, but it's really good to see that you're doing that, at least in a regional level. Pam, no, can I...
you just for the same question really in terms of childcare, but also I want to put another one to you which links to it, which is from Harriet Atkins, who says, how can we look after the physical and mental health of new mums in our region when it's difficult to see anyone face to face for non-emergency issues, e.g. physio, and with restrictions on close contact, e.g. baby groups, you know, so the old short start centres, if you like, how important they are to provide huge social support. I worry about the long term effects of the cutbacks in these areas. So what, what's your pick perspective yeah. on that? Yeah, I, I think, and just to pick up on what Deborah said, we, we've had in Greater Manchester a real focus on early years because it is absolutely critical and we've been supporting our uh, childcare sectors. And I'm really pleased to hear you, Sam, say about putting uh, pressure on the Chancellor around childcare because I think that's really important because yeah. Some, some view, some view um, the Chancellor's um, statements so far as not addressing uh, those issues around childcare and the things that women need to get back into the workplace. And actually, um, for me, not recognising women as an economic engine. Um, and I think the lack of... Um, uh, it, it's, it's almost, it's totally unspoken about the things that we need around childcare to support women uh, back into to the workplace. So I just wanted to echo what you said. On the specific around, um, you know, new mums and, and, and uh, you know, what, 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 can, what can we do to support new mums? I think that it, it has been incredibly difficult um, for new mums, um, particularly because some of those community health services have been pulled into other things um, quite naturally because of COVID and hospitals being short of um, staff and the need to service the NHS generally. So I think some of those um, things have been missing and we, we do need to stand them up. Um, you know, I personally know how important those things are and that they're very local. Um, so when you're a new mum, you need that local interaction. You need that face to face because it can be um, you know, it can be very isolating. So I think we, we have to stand those services up and we have to make sure that we do that. But also we have to, um, I think, facilitate things like this um, for new mums. It, it doesn't all have to be, it can be virtually face to face. Um, and I think sort of facilitating some more of that sharing would would probably be helpful um, but I agree with the person who asked the question that trying to stand those services up and while COVID continues we're finding different ways of, of bringing uh, new mums together but also bringing them together with the healthcare professionals that they need to interact with. Yeah absolutely and I think you're after right, finding new ways to do it because it's going to be a while yet before we can really return to anything like pre previous normality. Um, I'm just going to give you a couple more comments from the, from the audience and then come back to the panel. Um, Karen Peter says that there's a lot of activities and, and interventions which have been eliminated of, out of women's lives that will affect confidence. Feeling unable to homeschool adequately, not caring for older family members, no gym and socialising, all things women place a high value on. So that the, the things that are feeding that kind of knocking, knocking confidence, those mental health issues. And then Christina says, many key workers, females who are also single mums, suffer terribly for lack of childcare and homeschooling. And this is probably not well planned from the beginning, absolutely. I mean, it's quite single parents and be invisible from the government strategy, um, which is why we called our campaign Make Women Visible, because they certainly weren't as far as the government were concerned, including at decision making levels. Um, uh, Asma, I'm going to come back to you now to think, I want to focus on the rest of the conversation though on how we build back better and what the positives might be. So give you all a chance to think about how you, you can go forward out of this and what, you're each, um, what, what your priorities might be. But the things you would like to see both at regional level and national level actually might take us forward. So what do you think would be a really welcome step that perhaps could be done at regional level and then from, you know, from Boris himself? Do, do, you, do you want me to jump? That was to Asma, Asma Day. Actually, it was, it was Asma I was asking that. Hiya. Um, yeah, I think one of the biggest things I feel has been highlighted is that um, those who were struggling already or facing inequalities, um, the gaps have been widened. Um, and I do think that um, a lot of the reactions to the crisis and um, has, has happened after people have already suffered and um, so it's all been very sort of a lot of the decisions to help people has been very late so they've already you know people have been struggling to feed their kids or people have been worried about how, how you know how, how they're going to feed kids over summer holidays things it's all been 
um, you know, people are self-employed, have been worrying about how everything's happened after people have been suffering. So I think uh, one of the important things is to learn lessons for the future so people don't have to go through um, unnecessary suffering again before action is taken. But the other thing I think is really important is uh, to build back better is to listen to the voices of everyone from all diversities and the, one of the most important ways this can happen is to actually have people um, at the moment you know unfortunately a lot of organization they are still very male heavy at the top um, uh, male heavy white heavy uh, and I think I think what we need is people from all diversities and uh, not not just in the bottom tiers of organisations, but all the way through to the top, and but not just as a token gesture. They need they need to be there for the right reasons, and they need to be listened to, and all voices need to be heard, and um, they need to represent the communities that they're serving, and portray what what what's needed. And all the evidence shows, of course, that you, you get better decisions when you have diverse decision making. So that's absolutely vital and I completely endorse everything you've just said. Namira, from your perspective, is there anything you would like to see or in particular that you think would, must be an essential ingredient to building back better? Yeah, there's loads of things and, and things that have been touched on in the conversation. I think regionally, um, we're obviously on a countdown to the Commonwealth Games come in and that's an exciting time. So I think as a community, we have great things to look forward to. And I think for me, it's about the road to that being stocked with opportunity for entrepreneurship, entre business growth, mental and physical health, um, that increasing in women, and, and just seeing the settings set up so that we can get to a place of celebration and actually look at the city and be like, that really reflects what we look like. I, I know you guys are hot on stats and numbers so I don't want to get this wrong but I believe that is 43 percent of Birmingham's um, ethnic minority community make up the 43 percent so I think that reflecting and really focusing support on areas of, of areas of need for those people um, looking at that intersectionally and not making it uh, not, not tokenistic but I think to get true diversity you need to actually go on a deeper level to look at each industry so if I was taking that about music um, as my industry you know true diversity and looking at how it's affected would be looking at how it's affected promoters to how it's affected singers to DJs because each of us have different lifestyles we've got different paces and momentums to our daily work um, so the true diversity would be exploring how that affects everybody so yeah again bringing that back to a regional thing I think across industries looking at that and making sure that they're communicating between each other that's what I would love to see yeah yeah so I think that's again really important isn't it because the potential actually for the combined authorities when you come together as well to have a sort of impact with central government must be quite significant Deborah I just wanted to get your thoughts now on you know the, the West Midlands strategy for building back better and, and where you are with that and how how you're thinking about that and how you're thinking about women within that, you know, issues like childcare, social care and so on. What, are you, you know, well down on the road to you having your own plan? Yeah, yeah. So, so the, there are a number of things. I mean, to, to just reflect on how we make this, how we make this have real impact. So, so the data that has come out through the work that you've done through the state of the nation that West Midlands Women's Voice has uh has undertaken you know we need to be absolutely relentless in making people see and hear what this data is telling us and we need to, need to demand that people use that data to inform not just the recovery or the plans they have for recovery but the plans that they have for resetting whatever services they're going to deliver so um one of the things that covid has has done has make us you know rethink the way in which we live the way in which we work the way in which we travel the way in which we play you know so so all of this data right now needs to start informing people's thinking about that and the recovery that they're going to put in place i i agree with i can't remember who i think it was you Pam. i think that said women have to be part of the decision making um 
uh, and that's one of the reasons why we pulled together the citizens panel and we will continue to work with West Midlands Women's Voice to ensure that the voice of women is heard loudly. Um, I, I think we should be lobbying and um, you know, pushing government to start thinking about this in a different way. And, and, and whilst we can do it at a regional level, I think there's a kind of national call to action as well. You know, and Pam, I, I really hope that we can keep in contact beyond this because I think the relationship between Birmingham and Manchester, given that we, we have similar challenges, but also similar opportunities, I think there will be strength in numbers uh, in working with the Fawcett Society in, in lobbying governments for some of these things. Um, I think for me, uh, specific issues around skills, although I think we've got a good track record of, of supporting women both into employment and skilling them up. I think we need to be more thoughtful, not about the, necessarily about the what, but the how as well. And I think one of the comments on the side, sidebar, the chat, the chat room was talking about women uh, undertaking training and, and skills provision part time. Um, virtually doing more online courses to accommodate the kind of childcare and caring needs that they've they've got, and I just want to check that we're being thoughtful about that. Um, and and just just generally, you know, not not take no for an answer, you know. And and you know, one of the things that I'm really keen to to see is is that um, you know we've got a real opportunity to completely reimagine or revitalize whatever whatever kind of adjective you want to or verb you want to use but but there's a real opportunity for us to 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 do something different about our high streets and town centers now because you know they will need to be different and and i want us to take the opportunity to not think about you know bringing more retail in i want us to to take the opportunity to to bring more living space into our high streets, to more, more community and cultural kind of response and uh, facilities, and probably more important, local health provision. You know, what, what really upsets me is the fact that so many of our women from minority uh, ethnic communities don't take advantage of health screening facilities for cultural reasons or environmental reasons i'm 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 not sure but but there is there are too many of our babies that die before they're one because they haven't taken um advantage of of uh, antenatal and and postnatal kind of services for a variety of reasons and i think if we can put those screening services um, and childcare services in our local high streets, right in the middle of our communities, I think we'll get much better usage and we'll be able to access those women who have been isolated for too long in a much better way. So that's the kind of thing that I want to do. Yeah, do designing, I, designing around the reality of women's lives is absolutely fantastic. Absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, I think we, again, we fully, fully support that. Um, Pam, I just wanted to come to you now. And there's, there's a comment here from Charlotte who says, as, as a disabled woman, I worry that even more cuts to vital services, uh, services will occur in the aftermath of the virus. And we know from data actually we published a couple of weeks ago that disabled women were saying they felt more isolated, that they'd lost services and support, they'd lost informal support that they had because people weren't coming in to visit and just uh, just some day-to-day -day support that they were relying on. So we're really struggling. So. Just thinking about again those specific groups of particular need in the Greater Manchester area. What what are you thinking about? How will you build back better in Greater Manchester? I I think what we're trying to do is um, build back equally, because I think that's the word that's missing. Because we we yes we want it to be better, but we want it to be more equal. Um, and we've just done um, uh, our voluntary sector have just done a disabled. Uh, persons um, serve, which um, sh which which um, you know didn't show Greater Manchester in everything in a in a good light in terms of how disabled people were accessing services, particularly um, um, those people who've got autism, uh, those people who've got physical disabilities who relied on services to help them live their best life. Um, and what we what we are doing with that survey, for example, is every district is considering that survey so that as, as Deborah says, it's it's live data now using it now. Um, every district is looking at their services in a COVID world and saying, well, how can we improve these for um, people with disabilities and women with disabilities? 
and I think that's really important that we take that data and we do uh, make those changes now and we do it across the board. Some, some will be tailored depending on different districts, but some can be done at a strategic level. Um, and the leaders are already considering that data on, on what we can do. And I think that's really important. I think the other thing is, and Deborah's talked about Greater Manchester and, and the West Midlands working together. And absolutely, of course, we will do that. But what about the Northern Powerhouse? And um, is it a Northern Powerhouse uh, just for certain people? Um, or is it going to be a northern powerhouse which is going to embrace equalities and those mayors are going to uh, make sure that they are champion, championing those equalities um, and that we are, as, you, as, as has been said, making it real. Um, it's not um, strategic intent, it's actually delivering those differences as we do come out of recovery and we do live with COVID for a period of time that we are making sure that we're not building in more inequalities than we had before because we're also dealing um, with um, some new inequalities. Some disabled people uh, and disabled women didn't feel disenfranchised but COVID has had that impact on them. Um, so how are we going to re-energise that and, um, and Bring back that bring back that confidence. But we're actually considering that data now and making some changes now in Greater Manchester around that area. Well, that's really good to hear. So we're coming to the end of the event now. Um, I've only got one or two minutes left, so I'm going to come back to the panel for a very quick final word on what they think fundamentally uh, the national Westminster government needs to do to respond better to the regions. There's a link there too in the chat function to. Join Enforce It, you can go to our website, become a member if you want to support our work or make a donation to support these COVID events. Um, and also just sign up to the newsletter, that's free if you can't afford to make a donation or to join. Um, please do follow us on uh, social media. The hashtag for tonight has been the Corona Conversations. Um, and there's a nice message here from Karen Jett, who's very grateful to all the panel for supporting our drive to collaborate across regions, share learnings, have a joint voice when lobbying government. And I think that's really, really important because we're going to have to do a heavy lot of government, uh, government lobbying in the next few months uh, ahead just to really get some progress here. So, Asma, I'm going to come to you first. Is there one final message for national government in terms of how we respond better to the regions? I think um, it's important to not be so London centric and listen to voices throughout the regions uh, just to ensure people don't fall, fall through the cracks. And I think it's about actually properly listening to the issues raised and taking action on them and whether that means giving the power locally for action to be taken for a targeted approach but I think the most important thing is to you know look outside not not think that it's a one-size-fits-all mentality but look at different issues facing different areas and um, um, different people. Thank you and Namaira what would you like to see? Good. Yeah, um, so I think as a, as a direct response to listen, um, but also I think not only to listen, just the creative dissemination of the research, it needs to be understood by people who it's about. And also it needs to be easy to explain the most. And I think theater and music and the arts is, is the best place to get people to reimagine and to take a step out of their self for a second. So more of that conversation, definitely. Absolutely, we really need our creative industries without question. Pam, what's your message for number 10? I think the message is um, back women because they're part of the big part of your recovery programme. Uh, they're an economic engine. Um, make specific funding available that's targeting women, training, childcare, and also make sure that all women are digitally enabled because the Victorians made sure we all had clean water. Digital is the new currency and to have specific funding targeted at upskilling women in digital. Brilliant, thank you. And Deborah, I'm gonna give you the last word. So what would you like to say? Um, just everything that everybody else has said. I would also add Pam, you know, the green, Green tech revolution as well is uh, alongside digital is is going to be the area that we need and 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 actually we don't want to do it we need to do it 
you know, uh, yeah. you know, climate change is still a massive issue for us, and and actually was raised as a, a, by a lot of women, a lot of mothers in particular, who are very concerned about the future for their children. So, um, you know, I started this by saying the biggest overriding emotion for me in all of this was frustration, um, and and I and I kind of end with it because I still think that government needs to um, devolve more power and influence and resources and decision making out to localities. And I just, you know, go back to, to the issue I raised around, you know, localised healthcare. Somebody who works in Whitehall doesn't know what the needs of somebody who lives on Borsley Green Road is. Um, and they are the, 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 the women and the communities where we need to focus our energies most. So um, my, my, my challenge to government is have, have trust and faith in those that know best. Brilliant. Thank you very, very much. That's a very uh, appropriate message to end on. And again, we completely endorse that. If you get, look at this function, you'll see lots of interesting and useful links, including to our partners for today, West Midlands Women's Voice. So I want to give them a shout out. They've been fantastic to work with. Yeah. A huge thank you to our panellists, to Chris Hopkins from Savannah Comrades, who did some fantastic research for us, to Asma Day, Namaiwa, Pam Smith and Deborah Cadman. Please do join us again for another coronavirus conversations uh, event that we're going to be having in the next few weeks. We're going to keep these events going. And I think we need to return to the regions uh, another conversation, perhaps in a few months time to see how we're getting on with some of those messages for number 10 and others, but we're not going to forget about our regions and make sure that we do build that better at every level. Thank you very much for joining us. Goodbye. Okay, thanks, Sam. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.